Thank you for starting your week with us. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Ijeon in Seoul. Let's get started with a look at today's highlights. Korea's household debt grew at the second fastest rate in the world in the first half of this year, amid growing concerns of slowing economic recovery. With Korea being the world's third largest market for Bitcoin trading, the government is looking for ways to regulate the digital currency. These stories and more coming right up. Despite government efforts to curb borrowing, Korea's household debt keeps on rising to a point where it's threatening to derail the country's economic recovery. In fact, a new report showed that only one other major world economy saw faster household debt growth than Korea in the first half of the year. Our Won jong hwan starts us off. Korea's household debt has been taking up an ever bigger portion of the nation's economy over the past few years, hampering growth. According to the data from the Bank of International Settlements, South Korea's household debt to GDP ratio came to 93.8 percent as of the end of this June, a rise of one percentage point from the end of last year. That's the second fastest rate in the world, only China's has risen faster at 2.4 percentage points. Korea's household debt to GDP ratio is the eighth highest in the world, a position it's had since 2015. But the ratio is rising meaning debt is growing faster than the economy. In 2014, it rose 1.9 points, then 3.9 the next year, and 4.7 last year. All this debt is costing the nation more in terms of payments, too. As of the end of June, payments took up 12.6% of GDP, that's the debt service ratio, or DSR. From the end of last year, it was up two-tenths of a percentage point, marking the fifth highest rate in the world and the highest Korea has ever recorded. The DSR can be an early indicator of a systemic banking crisis, and when it's high, it hurts consumption and investment. The Korean government has rolled out several measures this year to cut down on borrowing by households, measures such as stricter screening for borrowers and controls on real estate speculation. Data show housing transactions have slowed down, but it's yet to be seen how effective the measures will ultimately be. Won jong -un? Business Daily. A private survey has found that nearly one in two young workers here in Korea begin their careers in debt. The biggest portion of the borrowed money went to student loans, but there were other expenses too. Our Eunice Kim explains. Korea's Shinhan Bank over September and October conducted an analysis of its customers' data, young people with three years or less of professional work experience. The inquiry found that 47 percent of such clients had taken out loans. Their outstanding debt averaged roughly $27,000, about 21 percent of which were comprised of student loans. 8% was going to mortgages and another 8% toward credit loans. Overall, young professionals were paying an average of $560 monthly to service their debt. But the job search process in Korea isn't necessarily over with a college diploma in one's hand. For higher-paying white-collar jobs, there are testing and licenses to be earned, which means extracurricular classes to prep for the best possible result. The survey found the average time it takes to prepare for such employment came to 13 months. And the average cost? Some $3,500, amounting to more than $260 per month, excluding living costs. Broken down by area, civil service preparations came at the highest cost at some $5,800, followed by specialist careers such as lawyers and doctors. Education and office jobs came thereafter. So then how do they pay for these costs? Most were working part-time jobs in addition to receiving financial help from family members. Those in current jobs said they'd be willing to jump companies for a 30 percent wage hike, which would amount to some $6,300 per annum. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. 
Korea's outbound shipments edged down in the first 10 days of December on the back of shorter working days and a high base effect. Data from Korea Customs Service shows some $12.7 billion in goods were exported from December 1st to December 10th, a 1.5% on-year fall. A 47% surge in semiconductor shipments was not strong enough to offset a 32% drop in auto exports and a 30% fall in wireless telecom equipment. However, total exports in the first 11 months of the year hit a fresh record high of $528 billion, thanks to a recovery in oil prices and global trade. And now, moving on to our coverage of the markets, we have our markets contributor Kathleen O joining us on the line. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, Jiyun. All right, so tell us how the local markets performed on the first trading day of the week. Local markets traded slightly higher today as institutions net bought Kospi and Kostak. While Kospi opened up higher from last Friday at 2468.77, foreigners and individuals continued to sell on profit taking, selling to 66 million US dollars worth of shares throughout the day. However, institutions net bought to 40 million dollars, which pushed the recovery in the afternoon. At the closing bell, the Kospi recovered 0.3% to close at 2471.49, while the tech-heavy Kostak gained 2.69% to finish at 764.09. Large-cap names including Samsung Electronics lost 0.42%, Hyundai Motors plunged the most in a year today, falling over 5% on the weaker China and global sales outlook. Meanwhile, service sector names Amora Pacific gained 1.72% and KTNG rose 3% on Rosia Outlook next year. On the currency side, we saw a quiet start of the week ahead of a major central bank meetings. The Korean one opened at 1092.5 and traded overall in a tight range closing at 1092.12. The dollar index nearly reached 90 last Friday on the back of the latest news on the U.S. government coming to an agreement to prevent shutdown and decent November labor market data. It slightly fell to 93.78 during the Asia session today. So with the week ahead, can you give us the latest rundown on major market events to look forward to this week? We're looking at a number of important central bank meetings this week. First, we have the December FOMC meeting decision in the U.S. this Wednesday. Currently, the markets have fully factored in a 25 basis point rate hike. The focus will be on Chair Janet Yellen's post-meeting press conference and the outlook for 2018. On Thursday, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England will hold its monetary meetings. The ECB is likely to raise its growth forecast higher, and we think it could signal the reaching of its inflation target by 2020. In other regions, the Central Bank of Philippines will probably stay on hold before raising rates in the first quarter of 2018. We expect no further rate cut from the Bank Indonesia. Central banks in Latin America, Mexico, Peru, and Colombia likely leave rates unchanged, while the Banco Central de Chile makes a rate cut. Lastly, on Friday, Russia's central bank is expected to cut its key rate to 8% as inflation has fallen well below target. It's certainly not the most and shifting our focus a little bit, where should we keep our eyes on in terms of global political events? A few political events may also affect investor sentiment this week. First, the Euro Summit will be held in Brussels this Thursday and Friday. Markets will focus on how the meeting between the UK and EU follow through from the first Brexit agreement last week. Also, broad issues in economic, currency and banking sector union in Europe will be the main topics. In the U.S., both the Senate and the House of Representatives will jointly discuss details of President Trump's tax reform bill. Twenty-nine members will try to come to an agreement on Obamacare and individual tax rate before next Friday. For Korea, we have President Moon visiting China from Wednesday. Moon will hold a bilateral summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping and hold meetings with high-level officials, including Premier Li Keqiang. This has been Kathleen O for Business Daily. 
Bitcoin's bullish run waned over the weekend as the currency tumbled 40% from its peak, although it did recover the $15,000 mark on Monday's opening. While the Korean government is looking into ways to regulate this digital currency, CME Group has launched its highly anticipated Bitcoin futures trading. Our Park ji has more. Seoul-based Yonam News reported Monday that Korean ministries related to virtual currencies, including the Ministry of Justice and the Financial Services Commission, will hold a joint task force meeting this week to discuss how to regulate the cryptocurrency market. Bitcoin's value has increased some 16-fold since the start of this year when it was trading at less than $1,000 per Bitcoin. South Korea is one of the countries witnessing the Bitcoin frenzy as it is the world's third largest market for Bitcoin trading after Japan and the U.S. With the government's intentions to mull over regulating the digital currency becoming known last Friday, Bitcoin's value plunged some 40 percent over the weekend, although it recovered to around $16,000 as of Monday morning. Bitcoin's futures are now also tradable on the Chicago Board Options Exchange, which is the world's largest futures exchange market. About 3,600 new bitcoins are mined every day, with about 16.5 million coins now in circulation. Park ji Business Daily. Samsung Electronics is one of the world's top five R&D investors for the sixth consecutive year. According to the European Commission's 2017 R&D Investment Scoreboard, Korean tech firms Samsung and LG Electronics were in the world's top 50 list for R&D investment. Samsung fell two places in the ranking compared to last year, but still came in at fourth place. For the fourth consecutive year, the world's top R&D investor is German automaker Volkswagen, followed by U.S. firms Alphabet and Microsoft. The U.S. had the most companies in the top 100, with 36 firms on the list. R&D investment by Chinese companies was up nearly 19% on year, and investment by the EU increased by 7%. Those of Korean firms, by comparison, grew less than 2%, well below the global average. Another case of avian influenza has been found at a duck farm in the southwestern part of Korea. The Korean government has ordered a 24-hour ban on the movement of poultry in six major cities and provincial areas to prevent a further spread. Our Park Se-young has more. The ban came into effect as of midnight after an H5 strain of the bird flu virus was detected on Sunday at a poultry farm in Yongan County. The Agriculture Ministry says poultry movement will be frozen at more than 40,000 farms, slaughterhouses and factories that may have come in contact with infected birds. Tests are underway to confirm whether the virus is of the highly pathogenic variety. The results are expected late Monday. The Agriculture Ministry has organized a team to conduct inspections during the 24-hour movement ban. Farms and related facilities in six major cities and provincial areas, including Daejeon, Gwangju, and Jeollanam-do province, that do not fulfill the guidelines or abide by the ban will be subject to fines and penalties. Tens of thousands of birds have been called so far, following Korea's first AI outbreak of the winter season, which occurred last month. Park Se-young, Business Daily. With the rising number of single-person households here in Korea, as well as people who are busy working, there's often little time for anything, let alone grocery shopping. But help is at hand. A new type of vending machine, the first of its kind in the world, is now allowing people to buy fresh meat on the go without having to stop by a supermarket or butcher shops. Our Yoo Jun Hee has more. Korea's locally sourced hanu beef and handon pork are winning over customers with their superior taste and quality, but their high prices mean they are not an option for budget-conscious buyers. For busy office workers and those living alone, even finding the time to visit the local butcher shop can often be a challenge. Hanu beef is delicious and comes with a premium image, but it's too expensive and often out of reach. To target these customers, 
A new meat vending machine has been introduced, the first of its kind anywhere in the world, which can be installed in office and residential buildings. Utilizing the Internet of Things, the machines provide information on the product's availability, expiration date, and storage temperature, which can be managed remotely and simply with the use of a smartphone. Allowing significant cost savings on distribution, fresh meat could be made available at far lower prices through the use of these vending machines. We are expecting our beef prices to become globally competitive, which in turn will benefit customers as well. The National Agricultural Cooperative Federation is planning to operate two machines on trial this year. If successful, the current plan calls for up to 2,000 meat vending machines to be installed by the year 2020, focused in areas with a high concentration of single-person households. Eugenie, Business Daily. The technology used in Korea's agriculture sector has improved by leaps and bounds in recent years. The country's technology is also being exported around the world, and in some places, it's being put, put to a very good use. Our Cho Sang-min tells us more. Korea's efforts to share its agricultural technology and farming know-how with developing countries are bearing fruit. The Korea Program on International Agriculture, also known as COPIA, under the Rural Development Administration, is in charge of developing technologies to help solve food shortage problem in some 20 nations in Asia, Africa and Latin America. The technologies co-developed with local institutions are customized so that they can seek the most amount of production in local terrain and weather. In Paraguay, Korean researchers helped cultivate high-quality rice seeds by synthesizing the Korean seed dubbed MS-11 and the local Indica specimen. Researchers say the newly developed seeds boost yield by more than 20 percent. It is a high-quality rice seed that grows well even in tropical conditions, and it also yields a lot. This will also help improve quality of other seeds grown in the local region. Korea also started supplying potato seeds and methods to cultivate them. These enzyme-modified potato seeds yield more as they no longer are affected by most existing viruses. Copia sent two tons of potato seeds this year and is planning to enlarge the shipment to 200 tons in 2019. The projects that we are working with Korea are important in a way that we can use their infrastructure and technology. Starting next year, Copia will provide eco-friendly technologies to cultivate tomatoes and paprika in the South American nation. It is also set to continue developing technologies in 46 agricultural items and work on 10 field demonstration projects in collaboration with local farmers around the world. Cho Song Min, Business Daily. Korea is being forecast to have the highest internet usage in the Asia Pacific region and the sixth highest smartphone usage by the year 2021. According to market research firm eMarketer, Korea's internet usage rate is expected to increase from 87% last year to 87.8% this year. Now that figure is projected to reach 89.7% by 2021. The report added that the total number of internet users in the Asia-Pacific region would exceed a 2 billion by next year. As electric cars steal the spotlight from gas-powered vehicles, the race to secure related patents has begun. According to the Korean Intellectual Property Office, domestic patent applications for EV technologies, excluding items related to batteries, jumped nearly 50 percent between 2007 and 2011. After a slight dip in the following years, the number rose in 2016 to reach 1,271 patents, compared to just over 200 back in 2007. Charging-related patents were the most common at over 20 percent of all applications. Charging time and convenience are currently seen as the biggest obstacles to the mainstream ad adoption of electric vehicles. Korean researchers have developed a new way to measure nanostructures used to make semiconductors, flat panel displays and sensors. Now, this breakthrough could help Korean firms win a bigger slice of the global measurement equipment market. Here's our Elliot Kim with more. High-tech industries that create semiconductors, flat panel displays and sensors are increasingly using multi-layer thin films to facilitate high-speed, high-capacity nanotechnology. And to meet the industrial demand for the internal inspection of such structures, Korean researchers have developed a new technology that can accurately measure multi-layer nanostructures. 
The researcher's optical inspection technique uses different wavelengths of light to measure the thickness of the film's surface without damaging the structure. When applied to the assembly line, the technology will be able to shorten inspection times during manufacturing, increasing productivity and cutting costs. When the technology is applied to equipment, it will start a ripple effect throughout the domestic equipment industry and then the display and semiconductor industries. The technology may be able to increase Korea's 3% share in the global measurement equipment market. The research was published in the online journal Scientific Reports. Elliot Kim, Business Daily. Japan's business sentiment for manufacturers has improved for the fourth quarter of this year. According to a joint survey by Japan's Ministry of Finance and the Cabinet Office, the business survey index for large manufacturers rose to plus 9.7 in the October to December period. This is an improvement from the previous quarter when the figure was seen at plus 9.4. Figures above zero indicates that firms are optimistic about the future business conditions. The improving outlook is being owed to a weaker yen and a 12% jump in the Nikkei on the back of improved earnings from automakers and smartphone component firms. The survey also showed that big manufacturers plan to raise capital spending by nearly 11% in the second half of the fiscal year ending in March. American coffee giant Starbucks has launched its first overseas roastery in Shanghai just last week. Now calling the opening an inflection point and the engine of growth for Starbucks, founder Howard Schultz says China is set to become the backbone of the coffee chain's operations. Our Lee Young has the story. A sprawling coffee culture is starting to bud in the world's biggest tea-drinking nation, that is, China. With a growing number of Chinese consumers flocking to coffee shops, big brand coffee chain Starbucks has launched its first overseas roastery in Shanghai as it sees China surpassing the U.S. as its largest market within a decade. I feel like this roastery offers some original roasting methods to make coffee. It is different from the current coffee made by machines, which is more like drinking for drinking's sake and producing for producing's sake. This place looks more high-end, much closer to the original coffee roasting and brewing methods. I think it should be better. This 2,700-square-meter outlet, about half the size of a soccer pitch, is also the company's largest store to date. And we strongly believe and we're committed to building a long-term business in China that will be bigger, more powerful, and more significant than our business in the U.S. The opulent flagship store that's equipped with gourmet coffees and bakeries is one of the 10,000 outlets that the coffee house is planning to operate in China within a decade. According to the International Coffee Organization, China's coffee demand grew by an average 16 percent annually since 2004, compared to a global growth of about 2 percent. If we look at the, the way that the, the Chinese customers are embracing Starbucks, embracing coffee, embracing the teas that we offer, uh, you know, we just look at the, the opportunity to build new stores, and there is no other market in the world that has the holding capacity of new store growth uh, for Starbucks is China. While the retail sales of tea still far outweighs that of coffee at the moment, Chinese consumers say the launch of this massive roastery is likely to further propel the coffee culture in China, setting China to become one of the leading coffee markets in the world. Yi Zhuyang, Business Daily. And that brings us to the end. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.